This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit on MPB Think Radio. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, Associate Professor of Preventive Medicine and Nurse Practitioner at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. And today is the beginning of Nurses Week. And so I have an ask of my listeners. If you have a story about an awesome nurse that has impacted your life in a positive way, we'd love to give that nurse a kudos and a shout out here. Um, I've collected some stories as well, and I'll read some of those as we go throughout the hour. But if you have a story, I'd love, um, love to hear it and love to share it with everyone else. You can always email us, and that email address is fit at mpbonline.org. We're also going to be going through my emails today. I get lovely emails from you guys um, out there listening, and I compile them. And when I get a, to a certain amount, I say, you know what, we need an email show, because there are other folks who are wanting to know the answers to these questions as well. So we'll dig through my email bag. But if you have a health, wellness, prevention, lifestyle question, any of those things are fair game today. All right. Nurses Week happens the same time every year, May 6th through 12th. So the first day is May 6th, regardless of what day of the week that is, right? So that was a Saturday this uh, this year. And the reason for that is it ends on May the 12th, which is Florence Nightingale's birthday. So that's why it always starts on the 6th. So Florence Nightingale is largely considered the kind of mother of modern nursing due to her focus on uh, you know, uh, sanitation and healing of soldiers during the Crimean War. She really focused on making sure that the body had everything it needed to heal. So good hydration, good nutrition, good ventilation and cleanliness. So as a preventive medicine provider, me and Flo, we're speaking the same language. So I always enjoy um, getting to, to honor her birthday. And I actually had the opportunity to visit the Florence Nightingale Museum in London. And let me tell you, I was a big old geek. Like I was geeking out in there and my husband was just looking at me like, this is not that exciting. <laughs> but I was having a blast. So I'm going to start with a nursing story and a nursing shout out. Um, that's very deep and personal to me. So, you know, I've shared on the show before about our middle child um, who was unfortunately, she was stillborn. And the nurse during that visit, and I was already a nurse, I was already a nurse practitioner, but the nurse that I had during that experience has forever shaped the way that I care for people and the way that I approach people. As a nurse, I knew that nobody wanted that assignment, right? You know, we think about the word assignment as the patients that we get. You know, when we come in in the morning, they give us our assignments, our list of patients that we're going to take care of. And having been a nurse for a while, I've taken care of people who were, you know, actively dying or moms who were laboring and were going to have a, a fetus who didn't survive. And I knew that that wasn't anybody's ideal patient assignment, right? You do it and it's fine and you take care of folks to the best of your abilities, but it is, it's, it hurts your heart, right? And it's a heavy heart assignment. And, you know, when I went in, of course, I was already having contractions and these different types of things and really was just overwhelmed, right? I had had a child previously. He was early. Um, so I'd never had kind of a good birth experience. I was already anxious. Um, but I just remember, you know, getting into my gown, getting in the bed, um, the doctor coming in, asking me lots of questions. And I love my doctor. He was, he did a great job as well, but I almost didn't know the answers to the questions because my brain was just 
overloaded. And I remember looking at the nurse and saying, I'm sorry. And she said, for what? And I said, I know this is not a fun assignment and you didn't want to take care of somebody whose baby is, has died. And she brushed my tears off my cheeks, wrapped her arms around me, and she said, this is the only assignment I would have wanted today. She was like, you are precious and so is your baby and I'm here um, for you. She said, I actually just took a class and a course on grieving and how to care for a mom who has lost her baby. She's like, so it's just destiny that I am your nurse today and we're going to we're going to walk through this together. And every one of those questions that, you know, somebody in the hospital would ask me, do I want an epidural? I would just look at her like, I don't know, do I want an epidural? And she would give me the information that I needed to make a good informed decision about that. If I wanted pictures, if I wanted to hold the baby, all of these different things that I didn't even really think about what my answers were going to be. She helped me walk through that. And that was such a powerful experience for me and for my family that we actually um, put a scholarship in place at the School of Nursing here at UMC um, to honor uh, her and honor um, to honor our baby and to honor that nurse and her dedication to providing compassionate care to families who are in the grieving process. So if you're a nurse and you're out there listening, um, know that every single encounter that you have with a patient is meaningful and that it may change the life of one particular um, patient or nurse out there. So from my heart to yours, um, thank you so much for all the things that you do to take care of everybody on a daily basis. The first question from my uh, mailbag, and this question actually didn't come by email. It came from um, a new patient that I had in clinic. And you know, I um, run the Lifestyle Medicine Clinic at UMC, and that's a newer term for folks, um, the term lifestyle medicine. And this sweet patient that I had, um, we we got got her all roomed, got her vital signs done, sat down, and she said, "So, what kind of medicine do you use? What like what kind of prescriptions are we talking about?" And I said, "Oh, well, this is a great opportunity to talk about the fact that we're not going to use any medicines, right? That is not to say that medicines are not important; they are vitally important. And so, I am not anti-medicine." in any way, shape, form, or fashion. Um, what I do uh, want us to remember is that medications, a lot of times, are used to treat symptoms of things, right? Our blood sugar medicines are treating that symptom of high blood sugar and helping keep that under control. Our blood pressure medicines are treating that symptom of elevated pressure, um, and we want you to take those, absolutely, as prescribed. But we also want to treat that underlying mechanism that is causing a lot of these issues. And that's often our lifestyle. So I don't often write prescriptions for medications. I write prescriptions for lifestyle. And that often gets me a funny look. They're like, what does that mean? Like, what are you prescribing me? But it becomes more apparent as we go throughout the visit and we start to talk about the different pillars of lifestyle medicine, which there are six pillars um, or kind of six buckets of therapeutics that I can use. Right. Uh, nutrition, which is largely whole food, plant based nutrition, um, good physical activity, stress management, good restorative sleep. Um, social connection, and then risky substance um, avoidance or reduction. And so I can write prescriptions in each one of those things. And just like medications are dosed, lifestyle is dosed as well. And we don't tend to think of it that way. And that's uh, one thing that anytime I have a student with me or um, I'm training someone, I really want to focus in on the fact that we dose lifestyle and we can suboptimally dose it and then it doesn't work as well or we can kind of max dose it out just like we can with a medication and I think of it in the way you know if we, if we pick nutrition right we all know that we probably need more fruits and vegetables right but if I just tell you to eat more fruits and vegetables that's not a good prescription and that's not dosed correctly because you could eat one more grape than you ate the day before, and technically you have eaten more fruits and vegetables, right? Um, but that's probably not going to lead to the health changes that we want to see. 
Whereas if I give you a prescription that is a half a cup of green leafy vegetables twice a day, every day for the next 30 days, that's written kind of like we would do a blood pressure medicine. And that's the appropriate amount of that particular vegetable to get to our our health goals that we're wanting to get to. So just like you wouldn't take um, a baby Tylenol for your headache, you would take the appropriate dose. We want to focus in on how we do that from a lifestyle perspective as well in using all of those different modalities that we use. And then in the hopes that some of those medications that we're on, maybe as our lifestyle gets better and we start to heal that underlying cause of disease, we're able to reduce some of those medications or even stop some of those medications. That is always done in collaboration with primary care provider or the specialist who has written that medication. I'm never just taking folks off of medications without, <laughs> without discussing that with the treating, um, treating team and treating provider um, because they are crucial, vital parts of our overall health and wellness. And we're doing a couple things on the show today. We are honoring nurses because it is uh, – National Nurses Week. I had a nurse story um, come in through social media. It says, Happy Nurses Week. Today, I would like to honor a very kind-hearted ER nurse named Michael. Not 100% sure of that, but I think that's his name. But he worked in the ER at CMMC about 15 years ago, which would now be Merit Central. Um, my little trip had developed appendicitis and we rushed him to Mumford Jones where they referred us to CMMC and Dr. Fisher. At 2 a.m., the ER nurses were trying to calm a little boy's nerves and his mom while inserting an IV the size of a one-inch PVC pipe. Not really, but it seemed that way to trip. He was an amazing, calm, and friendly nurse in the midst of our worry and stress. At the time, I was in nursing school and knew just enough to be scared, but not sure about it all. Michael talked us through it all and made us feel safe. So, Michael, if you're out there, if you're listening, um, you made a difference in that family's life. And thank you for being a nurse. All right. We had a question come in about opioid overdose. So if we're thinking back to those pillars of lifestyle and you're going, why are we talking about opioids? Uh, Substance use is one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. And we actually did a show a couple of weeks ago. Um, We had the folks from the Department of Health on to talk about um, substance use disorder and um, overdose uh, intervention and how to either prevent that or to intervene and help in the event of that. And we had a listener who submitted a question after the show that said, what are the symptoms of opioid overdose and the actual cause of opioid death? Great question. Symptoms um, usually are going to look like the patient is or the person is sluggish, right? So face and skin may be kind of pale. If you touch it, kind of clammy. And clammy is like moist and cool when, when you touch it. Um, maybe limpness, um, fingernails and lips may be kind of um, pale or even bluish color. That means we're not getting enough oxygen um, to all of our tissues. So you have that that bluish discoloration. Vomiting can occur. Um, Gurgling noises as well. That is um, a pretty significant um, issue because it may be that they have already vomited and have some of those secretions in their um, throat, unable to wake people up or arouse them. They're not able to speak to you, those types of things. Breathing and heart rate start to slow or even stop, right? And that brings us to the actual cause of death of opioid overdose is respiratory depression. So um, those medications um, depress out an area in our brain called a respiratory center, which is essentially what tells us to breathe, right? We don't You don't usually consciously think about breathing. You're just breathing. Now, you can certainly make yourself breathe faster or slower or deeper or more shallow with conscious thought. But the everyday breathing is um, usually automatic and controlled. And so this will depress that out. Um, That's um, and that's usually the primary cause. Now, you may also because of the lack of tone in um, kind of the upper part of your airway and esophagus, when um, someone vomits, they may aspirate that vomit or suck that stuff back down into their lungs, which just further compromises our respiratory system. Uh, so I can't um, 
promote that website enough that we talked about on the show a couple of weeks ago, which was OD free, like O like orange, D like dog free.org, which is a the Mississippi site um, that has tons of good information about um, substance use disorder, uh, overdose prevention. It's also where you can order your free Narcan kit. So Narcan is that reversal medication for use if you suspect someone is having um, an opioid overdose. It's delivered uh, intranasally means up your nose um, and that kit is free and can be ordered uh, from that website there and then the second piece of that is if you feel like someone is having an overdose um, one you cannot hurt them with that Narcan uh, if you're wrong um, and two always call 911 right um, if you are not sure what's going on or you know it's an overdose um, please go ahead and initiate the emergency response um, so that some additional folks will be coming your way to help you deal with that situation again that website was odfree.org and if you want to hear more uh, on our show that we did focused on substance use you can always find our episodes on our website mpbonline.org or you can um, download our podcast, which I really encourage you to do, because that way you never miss an episode. And we're there just at the touch of a finger. If you feel like you need to hear from one of your Southern Remedy hosts, um, you can do that by searching for Southern Remedy on a variety of podcasting platforms, whichever one is your favorite there. All right. Next question. Um, I had a full abdominal hysterectomy and developed an ileus. My question is, will this be an issue if I have to have any other kind of surgery in the future? And how long will it take for my stomach and gut to fully recover from the ileus? So let's um, let's unpack that a little bit. So an ileus is basically part of your gut just kind of doesn't wake back up. It just kind of gets sluggish, goes to sleep, and you don't move things through like you, you normally should. And so that, of course, can cause pain, bloating, distension, um, and can be an emergency if we can't, you know, if we can't get that thing restarted and things just start to back up in there. It is um, a known complication after surgery from a variety of reasons, right? One, we usually give you um, good medications in the OR um, that slow everything down, right? And then the pain medication that's used afterwards, depending on the type of surgery that you have, um, can also slow the gut down a little bit. Uh, and you're also usually not being super mobile and up and walking around, um, which is another risk factor for that. You may not be eating as much as you were or drinking as much as you were following that surgery. So. The first um, part of it, you know, how long was it going to take for me to feel better? Unfortunately, not a cut and dry answer, right? Um, it's going to be different for everyone, but most people should be feeling better and having significant pain reduction within a couple of weeks, right? Week to two weeks, feeling better there. So if you're not or you have any questions at all, contact your surgeon or your primary care, care provider or both, right? Um, and get some more information there. The second piece of it is, will I have an ileus again um, if I have a future surgery? And that, again, depends on what type of surgery you're having, where you're having it, right? There are surgeries that are going to increase the risk, right? So surgeries in the abdomen and in the pelvis, like you had for this particular surgery, carry a higher risk of having an ileus, right? The technique that's used, and by that I mean, is it an open procedure or a laparoscopic procedure, right? So a lot of you have probably had laparoscopic procedures where we just kind of poke little holes through and then the instruments and camera and those kinds of things are inserted. Um, in, into the abdominal cavity that way. Um, and then an open procedure is where you would have to actually make a bigger incision and open things up. So obviously the more invasive the surgery, the higher the risk of having something like an ileus, right? Uh, and then we want to pay special attention to you know, how long we're on pain medications. Are we eating and drinking? Are we getting up and moving around? That's why your sweet nurse that comes in the room and says, hey, let's, let's get up and go for a walk. And you want to 
you want to hit her. You're like, this is not fun. I don't want to get up and go for a walk. That's the the um, reason behind that uh, less than fun option that we're asking you to do. One is to get everything moving, um, decreases your risk for blood clots, but also helps just um, get um, guts back, woken up and things moving around and all those different kinds of things. So don't be mad at us. We're trying to help you out a little bit there. But the big piece of this is if you have to have a, a, a different surgery in the future, let your surgeon know that you have had an ileus in the past, right? Prevention is the key to a lot of these things. And so just letting them know different things start to click in their brain and different things that they can do to help decrease the risk of that occurring um, are really important. And so we want to make sure that um, your surgical team is aware of any particular um, issues that you've had and, and really any issue that you've had with a prior surgery. We want you to tell your surgeon whether you didn't tolerate um, one of the anesthetics that was used or a lot of people get a lot of nausea after surgery, please let your pre-op team know, know that as well because there are things that they can do, be a little, little bit more aggressive on the anti-nausea medications and those kind of things so that you're not quite so miserable when you come out of that. Plus, if you've got an abdominal incision, I don't really want you throwing up. So all of those things are an important part of um, just keeping you well and, and helping you have as good of a surgical outcome as we can. All right, I'm going to share another nursing story that came in, and this actually came in from Kevin Farrell, the producer of Southern Remedy. He's out today, um, but he sent me a comment anyway. Kevin's dad was a nurse and taught at the University of Southern Mississippi School of Nursing after retiring from the Air Force. Kevin says when he was badly burned on his foot while working in a restaurant, his dad Dad was with me every day to make sure the burn was properly cared for. So uh, it's hard to be the kid of a healthcare provider. Uh, it is. We tend to um, we tend to mother you a little bit in certain areas, and then also we're kind of just like walk it off in other areas. <laughs> um, but it's a special time, I'm sure, um, for Kevin and his dad getting to mesh his uh, love as a daddy and his um, love and care as a registered nurse as well. All right, we're also going to take a quick question about um, juicing. So I get this question a lot, um, and it says, can, I, can you talk about the benefits of juicing? And so I'm assuming we're talking about juicing fruits and vegetables and drinking them. Uh, and that's a little bit of a loaded question. So um, the benefit of that is hydration, right? You're going to be drinking something, so you're taking in more fluid, which the majority of us are a little low on the on the fluid intake on a, a, on a daily basis. Uh, and the majority of what we do consume is caffeinated, which just further kind of dehydrates us out. So you are getting some hydration that way. And you're also getting some micronutrients like vitamins and minerals. And depending on what the fruit is or what the vegetable is, you'd be getting um, you know, different vitamins and minerals that way. That's about the, the end um, of what I would consider a benefit of juicing. Um, the, the downside of that is that you get rid of all the fiber, which is so vitally important for keeping our gut nice and healthy, as well as um, uh, filling us up, keeping our blood sugar a little bit more stable, those types of things. Um, and you also, when you drink your fruit or vegetable, you're able to take in a large amount of calories in a very short time frame. And I'll, I'll put that, and I'll frame it like this. We actually had a patient who... Um, it was making a beautiful juice, sounded delicious, right? Um, but it was like a half a pineapple, a whole mango, half a cup of strawberries, um, all this kind of stuff. And so we have cool food models in clinic. And so I went and got all of those things, all the ingredients. And I sat them out and I said, could you eat all of that at one go? And she was like, good gravy? No, that's way too much. And then I just sat there for a second. I was like, let that sink in. And she was like, oh get it right like you would not be able to consume that number of calories from the whole fruit um, so it's a better option to eat that fruit and chew it and do all those kinds of things uh, if weight loss is your goal if um, 
blood sugar control is your goal, those types of things. It's much better to chew your fruit um, than to juice them, right? I get asked a lot of times, well, what about a smoothie? Um, smoothie has more fiber in it um, because you do tend to keep the, the whole fruit intact. It is the digestion has started a little bit by broken down somewhat. But again, it's more the speed with which you're able to consume those things. You can slurp a smoothie down in a relatively short time frame. So I usually recommend people do smoothie bowls. So that smoothie that you enjoy, dump it in a bowl, give you some good toppings on top of it. It's a good option to throw some whole f- um, fruits on there and eat that thing with a spoon, right? That way it just slows you down. You get more... Um, a more even rise in your blood sugar that way, and you give your brain time to catch up with your belly in saying, hey, I'm full. Thanks for joining us today on Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit. I'm your host, Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner at UMMC, and we are honoring nurses today as part of National Nurses Week. And we're also answering just your general health and wellness questions. So it is open season. Whatever you want to talk about, we are happy to talk about today. I've gotten lots of good emails that have come in, and so we are going through some of those. And we'll get right back into it, because this next one, this next question is a wonderful question, a question I get asked multiple times during clinic, but this did come from um, a listener who submitted this through email. Um, And it asks about GOLO. Right. So capital G, lowercase o, capital L, lowercase o says, hello, I was wondering what go low is. Is it something you think is an okay idea for weight loss? I'm in my 60s now and having difficulty figuring out what to do. That's an effective way of losing weight. In the past, a low carbohydrate diet has helped. All right. So this question, there's several parts to it. Okay, so the first part is sustainable weight loss, right? Healthy, sustainable weight loss and what that looks like, right? Um, We, you know, old way of thinking was just kind of simply calories in, calories out. And whatever, you know, you could just kind of out exercise whatever it is that you were eating as long as you were running a calorie deficit. And while that may cause some initial weight loss, we usually see plateaus with that because you get to the point where you're just kind of starving yourself and everything slows down, gets sluggish, um, and you stop losing weight. You get really frustrated with that. Um, And the then the other option is, well, I'm going to either work out more or cut cap more calories. And that's just not a sustainable way um, to build health, right? Because usually what is going to suffer when we lose weight that way is muscle mass. And we want to make sure that, especially as we're aging, that we preserve our muscle mass as much as possible. Um, that's what's going to keep us uh, stable, what's going to help us not fall down, Uh, If we have to have a surgery or a procedure or any of these kinds of things, it's going to help us um, in the post-operative period and rehab. So when we go on drastic diets where we eliminate, um, you know, whole food groups or, you know, certain macronutrient groups, then um, we often lose water weight kind of on the the beginning end of that. And then unfortunately, um, lean muscle tissue is often sacrificed. And lean muscle tissue, uh, I mean, the secret is the fact that it's what burns calories for us. So when you lose that lean muscle tissue um, and you go off of whatever diet you have been on, that's why you gain all that weight back plus a little bit more. It usually brings some friends with it. All right, so we'll put a pause on the go low because I do have um, Edward, who is on the road, to share a nursing story. Good morning, Edward. Hello. Hello. Good How morning. can we help you? Hey, I'm doing a shout-out to my daughter-in-law. Wonderful. She is a neonatal a traveling nurse. Wow. And they live in Boise. Yeah. Idaho, and... Uh, they travel every they they leave they've been in New Hampshire back and forth mm-hmm. and all that stuff. Anyway, yeah, she's real cool. <laughs> well, I don't know her, but I agree that she's real cool because neonatal nurses are a special breed um, of nurses to take care of those little tiny little humans um, and their families. Um, that's the piece that a lot of people don't think about, but it's the love and care that they show the families of those babies that's so important. 
it's probably a lot of work. It, 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 it's a lot of hand washing, let me tell you. I did a rotation in the neonatal intensive care unit when I was in school, and I was like, oh, my gosh. I thought I washed my hands a lot, but these, these ladies and gentlemen have washed their hands till they are just cracking. So uh, it is a hard job, I would imagine, but I bet um, tons of good uh, reward when they see those babies go home. Plus, she does sign language. Her father what? has been uh, her father's been deaf her whole life, so she does that also. That's wonderful. So, I mean, you know, I mean, if someone has you know parents that don't know how to you know speak, you know, right. they need to do sign language. So yeah, it's Emily Townsend. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you for calling to honor Emily Townsend, and she can uh, listen to you honoring her. Um, online if you want to share that link with her or our podcast you can uh you can do that and she can hear your shout out thank you edward for giving us a call really appreciate that and thank you for thank loving you. on a nurse thank you very much i love you guys oh, great. well we thank you for listening have a safe trip bye bye so we were talking about golo so i was kind of giving my my uh my stock answer on healthy eating and so i want to dig into what golo is of course it is a commercial um program and so I, uh, I did a fair amount of digging on their website, right? And just like any commercial um, product or diet, there are things that I think, hey, this is pretty good. And then some things that I don't love quite so much, right? Um, one of the things that I don't love quite so much, but I completely understand is the fact that I can't see exactly all the details without paying for it, right? Which I understand. If I was selling something, I wouldn't want to give you all the details on the front end either. But in essence, the GOLO program has kind of two components. One is what they call the GOLO for life plan, um, which is their um, their diet plan, their nutrition plan, and then a supplement, which they call release. Um, and so uh, the whole program is both of those components, the, the nutrition or lifestyle change piece of it and the um, supplement piece. So I'll start with kind of the lifestyle piece. I could, you know, of course, I can't see all of the details of it, but the, the general things that were talked about sounded pretty good. Right. Um, they were talking about um, getting rid of diet mentality and not focusing on being on or off a particular diet, which I can wholeheartedly support there. Um, strategies for dealing with your kind of relationship and your emotions around food. Again, a big piece of a healthy dietary pattern is why we eat the things that we do, not just because uh, they taste good, but what are you know our emotions and our relationship around those different um, kinds of things. Um, looks like it delivers somewhere between 1,300 and 1,800 calories a day, which depending on your current body size and whether you're male or female and whether you're trying to make, you know, uh, build muscle or any of these different kinds of things, 1,300 calories is like not a lot of calories. Um, and so I would actually probably say for the majority of folks, 1,300 calories is too low for sustainable weight loss. 1,800 is pretty reasonable um, for most women. If you're uh, a man, that may not be enough calories for you either, depending on your level of physical activity and those kinds of things. The second piece of... Um, of this program is the supplement piece or the release um, is what they're calling it, um, the release supplement. And, you know, uh, kudos for the fact that they do tell you what's in it. Right. So that was my first thing. Anytime I see a supplement is what is in this thing. Right. And is there any science behind what is in it? And so um, if you go on the GoLay website, there is um, a graphic that shows you all of those things. It's got some things that most people probably recognize, like zinc, magnesium, chromium, um, which have some. Uh, some science behind maybe blood sugar stabilization and that kind of thing. Um, and then their proprietary blend um, of some different plant-based um, kind of nutraceuticals. Um, rhodiola, uh, berberine, gardenia, banaba um, are just a few of the ones that are in there. And so I went and pulled each one of those uh, to see what the science was behind those. And uh, there's not a ton of science behind those individual supplements. Um, and when you have something that has a bunch of the supplements in it at one time, like what helped, 
right? Which one of those things was most beneficial? Um, the, the theory behind some of these is that they help with blood sugar regulation. They help with insulin resistance, those types of things. Um, but supplements, even though they're natural, do not necessarily mean they don't have side effects or they don't have interactions with other medications. So that's something we want to be really careful with. In particular, the rhodiola extract in here um, can have some significant interactions with diabetes medications, with blood pressure medications, some of the other um, uh, ingredients in here can cause low blood pressure or even some kidney issues, those types of things. So do I think that this program is necessary or the supplement is necessary? I don't. Um, you know, a lot of these um, same compounds can be gotten from whole food sources. Um, supplements are also not regulated by the FDA. So just because it says that's what's in there doesn't necessarily mean what that's what's in there. I will say they posted um, several uh, um actual scientific studies of their product. And while the sample size was very small, which again, that's going to limit how um, our ability to be able to apply that data across populations, um, it was some positive uh, data in that. So um, would I recommend it? Probably not, just because I'm not a supplement fan um, for the vast majority of people. Um, But if you're considering it, please discuss it over with your healthcare provider so that we can make sure that we don't have any of those medicines um, that would interact with any of the things that are in this. I'm Josie Bidwell, and we've been honoring nurses today and digging through my email bag and taking your health-related questions. Um, we have a caller on the line from Gulfport. We're going to say good morning to Donna, and how can we help you? Hi. Um, well, first of all, I would like to give a little shout out to my uh, nurse granddaughter who works for a surgical clinic here in Gulfport. Wonderful. Um, And my question is, I'm a healthy 76-year-old. I do have asthma, but it's not problematic. Okay. I don't get get, uh, an asthma attack with any extreme, uh, unless it's extreme, you know, exertion. But I noticed that I, I, if I walk 100 yards and I feel fatigue in my legs and I might get a little bit winded and I want to know what a good approach to an exercise program would be for me without harming anybody. <laughs> yeah. All right. So when you say fatigue in your legs, are we talking about they feel heavy or there is actual pain in your legs? No, it's just, I know I've done it, you know, kind of thing. I, I, I feel the muscles. I feel the, hey, I've been using those muscles, and they're telling me about it. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. All right. That's a different different set of things than what initially I thought you were talking about, which would be something called claudication, which um, absolutely needs to be evaluated by a healthcare provider because it usually um, is some kind of impairment of blood flow to those muscles or even uh, like... Um, uh, innervation or, or nerve um, function of those particular areas. So if you ever have pain, feels heavy, those types of things, absolutely see your healthcare provider for that. Just your general old, I uh, hadn't used those muscles in a while and they're letting me know about it. Um, is yeah. pre- is pretty common, and you know one of the things we want to do is. Uh, turn our our exercise into to bite size pieces, right? So a lot of times people mm-hmm. see that recommendation for thirty minutes a day, and they think I gotta I gotta do this all in one whop, right? But we don't. So you know you can break it down into five minute increments, those kinds of things to prevent kind of that fatigue from setting in. One of my favorite activities, though, if you have access to it, is in the water. Okay. Um, when we have um, leg pain, back pain, those type knee pain, any of those types of things, um, as well as we're kind of a little deconditioned, meaning we haven't been exercising as much as we um, maybe have in the past, being in the water is a great way to do that. You're able to move your joints to um, more of their full range of motion without having to push against gravity. 
right? Um, you're in the water. And so the buoyancy of the water helps with that. And so you're able to still work on um, resistance exercises, which are really important for growing and keeping that good lean muscle tissue, um, but taking some of that extra pressure off. Um, you can also do chair exercises as you're starting to build up those muscles and those mobility. One of my favorites is sitting in a chair and literally like high knee marching in place for like 15 to 20 seconds and then taking a break and repeating that a couple of times. Another of my favorite chair exercises is what we call leg extensions. So you're sitting in that chair and literally like you're kicking somebody, right? You just extend your leg all the way out, hold it for a couple seconds and then bring that leg all the way back down and you alternate legs for kind of eight to 10 times on each leg. Um, And those can kind of start to build some of those uh, muscles without having as much impact and as much um, exertion on your overall system at a time. Okay. Is there any recommendation as to the length of time in the water? So ultimately, we want people to be getting 150 minutes of of exercise per week. But since we're just starting, I would start with 10 or 15 minutes and see how we do with that. Um, And as you get more used to it, then you can increase by, you know, three to five minutes until you get to that 30 minute goal. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And happy nurse, Nurses Week to you as well. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And happy Nurses Week to your granddaughter. All right, guys, um, we got just a minute or two left. So um, we did have someone who called in and said, I missed the end of your sentence. Did you say, yes, do go low or no, don't do go low? And it's not that easy, right? It's <laughs> it's a Talk to your healthcare provider about it. Um, the actual nutrition part of it um, may be okay. The supplement, again, supplements are not regulated by the FDA. So I, in general, I don't usually recommend supplements, um, especially without checking with your healthcare provider to make sure there are not any um, interactions. That being said, um, nothing was abundantly scary when I read the program. I'm just in general not a super fan of commercial diet programs because, um, again, you usually go on those things and go off those things. And I want you to build a sustainable pattern for a lifetime. And that you actually had a question that came in and says, should I be taking a multivitamin? And that kind of gets lumped into that same thing. Your average um, adult probably doesn't need a multivitamin. There are specific categories of folks who do. <clears throat> People who are pregnant or breastfeeding, um, people who are on certain medications that impair the absorption of things, people who have had a um, a metabolic surgery like a a gastric sleeve or bypass, they do. Um, But the vast majority of folks probably don't need at least a multivitamin. You may need some individual vitamins like myself who I don't eat animal products. So I take a B12 and a vitamin D um, for those reasons, because theirs are not as plentiful in a plant-based diet. All right, guys, that was a quick show. If you didn't get your question into us, please email us. That email is fit at mpbonline.org. And remember that you can catch all of our shows in their entirety by downloading our podcast by searching for Southern Remedy wherever you get your podcasts. And Southern Remedy is a production of MPB Think Radio and funded in part by a grant from the University of Mississippi Medical Center. I've been your host, Josie Bidwell, nurse practitioner and associate professor of preventive medicine. Make sure you tune in every weekday at 11 for the full Southern Remedy lineup. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.